we have to focus on reopening our economy. Uh, America cannot afford to be shut down unnecessarily uh, much longer. And Congress should be leading. Uh, but instead, uh, because of Speaker Pelosi and House Democrat leadership, uh, Congress continues to stay holed up. And that's not leading by example, especially when you consider that uh, many, many Americans uh, never did uh, stop working. Uh, we had essential workers and, and not just in the healthcare occupation, but, but also in many industries across America never stopped working. But Congress is, is still holed up in, in their homes because of the decision of Speaker Pelosi. And I think that's terrible. I think that sets a terrible precedent. And I'm uh, getting more upset about it each day. So now I want to begin with my questions for Ms. Grimm. Ms. Grimm, in your report, you said there was a widespread shortage of PPE. According to a recent Homeland Security report, China had been limiting the export of PPE and purchasing large quantities of PPE for months while hiding the severity of the pandemic. It seems clear now that a significant cause of the shortages was China's efforts caused our PPE shortages. Has your office considered analyzing China's efforts to limit exports and purchase substantial quantities of PPE? We thank you. Thank you for your question, uh, Representative Comer. We do not have work currently looking at this, and a key reason is that the CARES Act directs the Department of Health and Human Services to enter into an agreement with the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine uh, to evaluate U.S. dependence on critical drugs and devices that are sourced or manufactured outside of the U.S. And in that uh, legislation, it says that it may include analysis of the supply chain of critical drugs. So at this moment, we do not have work in that exact space. We do have work that is ongoing, looking at uh, foreign in, uh, inspections of drugs. Okay. The president had already been working with the private sector to manufacture more PPE for nearly a month prior to your report's release. Why did you not include the ongoing efforts by the administration to address the PPE shortage caused by China? Uh, thank you for that question. So the, the report used uh, was really designed to be a quick snapshot of what was happening on the ground in hospitals. And we interviewed hospital administrators uh, again, we had an 85% response rate. It was based on a prior survey methodology that was used for an Ebola response. And yeah, the only um, entity that we did interview for that report, and I will note that that report uh, started, the start notice was issued on March 23rd. We had a report out on April 6th. And it is my understanding that this committee and others are looking for uh, rapid response information with which to make decisions. So we made choices in uh, in being able to provide quick turnaround information on the perspectives of hospitals. Okay, my, my last question. There have been numerous public stories that the Chinese government hid the severity of the pandemic early on and the World Health Organization enabled them to do so. Did the delay in understanding the severity of the pandemic cause a delay in the administration's ability to respond? We do not have current work looking at that. That would fall into um, that general idea of response and timing. Um, now, we believe is not the time to be looking at issues like that. That falls into our effectiveness category. So our strategy, uh, as I articulated earlier, protect people, protect funds protect infrastructure and ensure effectiveness. So we'll look back at uh, some of the decisions and how and what um, actions were taken as a result of information. That would be something that we would uh, potentially consider down the road. Well, hopefully Congress will uh, get back to Washington and get back to work so that uh, we can start to begin taking steps uh, to limit our dependence on China for PPE and vaccines and all uh, sorts of essential healthcare products that are currently manufactured in China that we would like to see uh, begin manufacturing in, in the United States. Madam Chair, I yield back.
Thank you. Next, we will go to Mr. Raskin. Mr. Raskin, you are now unmuted. Um, I, if there's if there's a question being asked or a statement being made, I, I cannot hear it. Okay, I think Mr. Raskin is having some technical difficulties. So we are going to move to Mr. Sarbanes for now. Mr. Sarbanes, you are now unmuted. Uh, Ms. Graham, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, excellent. So I found this description of uh, inspector generals, which I just wanted to read real quickly. A U.S. federal inspector general is the head of an independent, nonpartisan organization established within each executive branch agency assigned to audit the agency's operation in order to discover and investigate cases of misconduct, fraud and abuse, and other uh, abuse of government procedures occurring within the agency. And I just read that because, um, frankly, I don't know that a lot of members of the public um, actually know what an inspector general does, but also because that description emphasizes a point that you've made and that a lot of my colleagues have made, which is how critical the independence of your work is to the result we seek and that you're really acting on behalf of the public when you conduct that. And that's why these protections that we've talked about in terms of how the inspector generals operate, how in this instance you operate, uh, that that is, um, that you're able to maintain that independence, be protected against uh, retaliation and other sort of political maneuvers. So we're gonna continue as a committee to insist on your independence and we thank you for carrying out your job with that particular mission in mind. I did want to talk a little bit about process because it's it's really important for us uh, as committee members to make sure our expectations of what you can do and how quickly you can do it um, is in line with sort of what's possible and the reality of it. So obviously you have categories of review within HHS, whether it's the strategic national stockpile or it's nursing home shortages of PPE how hospital dollars are being distributed, whether that's being done uh, properly. Um, can you tell me real quick, how much of the broad-based review that you undertake is um, tied to sort of an initial work plan uh, that you draw up ahead of time? And how much is it in response to issues that come up, specific issues that get raised? And that, I guess, could happen through press accounts of things that are going on, whistleblower complaints that may get filed, uh, issues that members of Congress bring up. Can you tell us kind of how you allocate your time and focus between those two baskets of response? Uh, thank you for your question, Representative Sarbanes. I think you're very well informed in the various ways that information might come to us, all of the above is uh, the, the way that I would answer that question in, in terms of um, the way uh, accounts or uh, possible issues might come to us. We do, we are, um, uh, we have closely to the uh, requirements uh, for the funding that we get. About 80% of our work is to look at Medicare and Medicaid and the other 20% is to look at some of the issues that are sort of basically outside of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We, um, of course, if, some, if we're made aware of an issue, um, for instance, abuse and neglect in a nursing home that we see in a newspaper, we would follow up on that um, appropriately. We consider um, input, of course, from Congress, congressional requests from uh, the department uh, as a result of the reports that we do and issues that we find and following up on them. So there are a variety of ways that uh, we, we, we come to 
an idea. We have an incredibly rigorous uh, work planning process. We, on a weekly basis, bring together what I refer to as our sort of board of directors here in OIG, which is a multidisciplinary team that consists of our head of investigations, our head of audit, our head of, evalu of, uh, of evaluation and inspections, um, our management and policy team, and our data experts to deliberate on possible ideas, whether it would be a good investment for OIG, um, the opportunity cost for doing one thing versus another. As you know, we have uh, you know uh, south of four hundred million dollars in order to oversee now with the CARES Act, uh, you know close to two point five trillion dollars. So we do have to make choices for the kind of work that we do. You raised another let me, issue. Let me, yeah, let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. So, let's just take the example of some hot topic. Something mm -hmm. comes up. There's been a news story and um, members of Congress are concerned about it. Uh, we flag it. I assume the method is that um, we bring it to the Committee of Jurisdiction, in this case, um, uh, the Committee on Oversight and Reform. The committee translates its interest in having you address this issue of the, whatever that hot topic is. Um, what happens then in terms of your ability to respond? And then when you do generate observations about this or findings, and what's the fastest time frame um, one could expect that that kind of, and obviously will vary, but, but you know, err on the fastest way you could turn around something on a very specific concrete issue. And then when you generate your findings inside, what is where does that go? What's kind of the chain of command for reporting that up? And then out to the party that originally inquired, in this case, a committee, because I think it goes to the independence question. We're very nervous based on things we've seen um, over the last uh, couple of months that uh, there will be undue pressure, influence, et cetera, exerted. So I'd like to know, how do you respond to a hot topic how do you generate your observations? Where does that go, as it were, internally within your agency before it can then come to us? And what's the fastest time frame we could expect? And with that, I'll, I'll yield back once you answer that question. Uh, I would be hard pressed to identify a, a faster product than um, the hospital preparedness report. Um, that was one of our sort of faster products. Other examples of fast turnaround products include uh, fraud alerts, early alerts, if we're finding Im immediate jeopardy during the course of our review, like looking at nursing homes, we would alert the public. Uh, well, actually, we always alert the department before we release a report to the public. Uh, we have data briefs on things like opioid use. And in some instances, we release sort of our formula for how we do our work so that other states can learn from it. And an example there is our sort of toolkit on opioids, which we have released uh, broadly for other states, for instance, to use. The process, um, when we have a report in draft, if it has recommendations, uh, we are required to uh, get input from the department that we oversee for recommendations. And so we, of course, do that. Uh, that takes time to do. Uh, we consider uh, input on our recommendations and we typically ask 30 days for a response to our reports. Sometimes it's faster that we ask for comments. And then um, we have a very sort of arduous review process in, internally to make sure that we are adhering to our professional standards and that the quality standards are met before it is released. So the uh, the uh, turnaround products that I mentioned, fraud alerts, early alerts, pulse survey, data brief, and toolkits, those could be some of the um, faster turnaround products. I know this committee in particular is interested in flash reports. Um, I have to say that, that it depends on the topic, it depends on the data, um, it depends on the availability of staff. If you're asking you know, to do a um, you know, uh, an on-site survey of nursing homes, which is something that we're doing as part of our coronavirus response work, that takes time. And we need to make sure always that we meet our professional standards of conduct before we publish a report. I hope that answers your question. 
Thank you. Next, we will go to Ms. Miller. Ms. Miller, you are now unmuted. Thank you. And thank you, Chairman Maloney. And thank you, Ms. Grimm, for being here today. Uh, I do want to echo my colleagues' frustration on how we are conducting business. I think we belong in Washington, D.C. We were elected to be in Washington, D.C., and I think we should do a better job. We can figure out how to have these committee meetings. I also think that we can all agree that we have taken the response to the pandemic almost on an hour by hour and day to day basis. Situations on the ground can change very rapidly in a matter of minutes almost. And our first responders and our medical centers have learned to evolve rapidly. This report was released at the beginning of April and its findings were sourced at the end of March. There's been a significant amount of improvements that have occurred since this survey and the report's release. You know, we drastically increased our production of PPE through the Defense Protection Act. And quite frankly, the American people have risen to the occasion. Um, many of my colleagues have situations in their own districts where companies have stepped forward and are producing things to help us through. Um, Ms. Grimm, are you doing appropriate comparisons of the data that you have in the same type of time frame that you picked this first batch to put it in perspective? This is um, just a snapshot. Correct. It is just a snapshot. Um, and I appreciate your question, uh, Congresswoman Miller. We, I, we acknowledge, I acknowledge at the, at the beginning of the briefing that the department has done a great deal to address uh, the, uh, the issues that were raised in the hospital preparedness report. Uh, steps to address uh, protective equipment, ventilator shortages, including by entry into contracts um, <clears throat> under the uh, Defense Production Act. They've also addressed hospitals' uh, financial shortcomings uh, by uh, approving advance payments to Medicare providers and distributing relief funding. There has been a tremendous amount that has been done uh, since this, since that snapshot report, uh, March 23rd through March 27th. I just feel like it would be a fairer comparison if you did use the same data requirements and if you're doing it every two weeks to show how we have improved as we've gone along because I mean, this pandemic, None of us have had this kind of experience before. And, and to see how we have improved, anytime you do any kind of action or any production that is brand new, at the end, a company or a, a government, you, you look over what you've done and you, you go through the woulda, coulda, shouldas as you go forward, but you also notice what you did well, what you didn't do well, and how you can improve. Do you think the administration has taken actions to increase testing capabilities? We don't have work looking at tests. We don't have work looking at increases in testing capabilities, the supply chain of testing. So it would be challenging for me to speak to that authoritatively. What I will say, what I will say in response to your question, um, my uh, briefing today. Um, I, I, I am desiring to talk about our 14 ongoing uh, COVID reviews. Uh, we have work looking at um, how funding is, uh, how, what oversight is happening with funding. We do have work looking at testing, um, at CDC's process of approving, producing, and distributing COVID test kits, the review of FDA's emergency use authorization. We have work looking at um, nursing homes, life and safety issues in nursing homes, uh, how they have responded in terms of the safety protocols that they put in place, uh, work looking at the stockpile. And we do have follow-up work uh, looking at CMS. Uh, it's not follow-up work, but work on hospital preparedness, looking at CMS's internal controls over hospital preparedness. The report that we did on March 23rd through the 27th that was published on April 6th, uh, was uh, the right report to do at the time, given uh, where we were at. We do not have 
uh, that exact methodology uh, happening, looking at hospitals uh, uh, as follow-up. We have other work that we have moved on to do, but I acknowledge the department has taken steps to address a lot of the issues that were uh, raised in our report. And I think that's fair. Uh, in my town of 50,000 people, we had free testing this past weekend, and I know the health department was disappointed the first day only 600 people showed up for free testing. So, you know, we're all learning as we go on, and, you know, I appreciate what you're doing, and I think we just need to be fair and con continue to get better at what we're doing. I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Next, we will go to Mr. Raskin. Mr. Raskin, you. are unmuted. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Grimm, uh, thank you for your report and your presentation. Um, it's May 26th, and uh, we have now lost nearly 100,000 Americans in this pandemic crisis, more Americans than we lost in the Vietnam War, the Iraq War, and the Afghan War combined, we have 38 million Americans thrown out of work, um, unemployed right now as a result of this crisis. A million and a half of our people uh, have contracted the disease uh, at some point, and the numbers might be as much as double that because so many people have not been tested who actually ended up getting it. Um, I can only regard with amazement uh, some of the self-righteousness of uh, some of our colleagues when Obama was president, we had an, a pandemic crisis with the Ebola crisis, and we lost two Americans, two Americans. So this crisis now under President Trump is 50,000 times worse than what we saw under the Ebola crisis. Now, in your report, Ms. Grimm, you canvass hospitals, and I just want to go over the major findings to make sure I understand them. Um, first, the hospitals reported severe shortages of testing supplies and extended waiting periods for test results. Is that right? Uh, hospitals reported their most significant challenges centered on testing and caring for patients with COVID-19 and keeping staff safe from infection. Okay, I, I mean, I'm just quoting from the report that, that there were severe shortages of testing supplies and extended wait for test results. I see widespread shortages of PPE, difficulty maintaining adequate staffing and support staff, uh, difficulty maintaining hospital capacity, shortages of critical supplies, materials, and logistic support, citing IV therapy poles, uh, medical gowns, linens, toilet paper, cleaning supplies, um, and so on. Now, did you make any conclusions as to why they were experiencing these chronic shortages, these severe shortages in the materials they needed to respond to the crisis? No, we we asked what their challenges were. We asked how they were dealing with it, and they asked, we asked uh, what they needed uh, for assistance for. Okay. Federal assistance. Gotcha. So you, you had a limited scope there. So are you going to look into the question of whether the HHS or CDC have actually been directing the allocation of these resources? Are you going to look at the question of how the supply chain is broken down? Um, we don't have work at this moment looking at supply chain issues. Um, while we do have work that is uh, going to be looking at an audit of the uh, Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response Operation of the Strategic National Stockpile. So we are okay. looking at that aspect. Okay, so in your survey, the hospitals, um, in addition to obviously they're wanting the government to meet these severe chronic shortages across the board of the materials they need, you also found that the hospitals, and I'm quoting here, wanted government to provide evidence-based guidance to provide reliable predictive models to help them prepare for the crisis and to prohibit, or rather, and to provide a single place to find the information they need, like a centralized repository of information. That little <laughs> fact has jumped off the page for me. In other words, there's no single place where the hospitals can even go to find out about any of these issues about either what the best public health science uh, advice is 
what the guidance from the government is for how to break through the complexities of the supply chain? We did, we did uh, report that that's what hospitals uh, were telling us. And uh, if there's you know, generally one outstanding recommendation related to emerging infectious disease, it does, uh, it does uh, touch on uh, the need for uh, coordinated guidance. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, uh, you know, um, I'm assuming because there was nothing in the report about it, but I will ask you whether any of the hospitals were complaining about the Chinese government interfering with their ability to obtain the supplies that they wanted. It seems like some of our colleagues want to try to now point the finger at China which is fascinating to me because I count at least 37 different statements by President Trump in January, February, March, and April praising the Chinese government and defending the performance of General Z here. So uh, there, there's a lot to fault with China's performance in this matter, especially their suppression of the truth early on and the doctor who was trying to blow the whistle. But President Trump seem to be defending them and praising their conduct from the beginning. But I'm just wondering, did any of these hospitals actually complain about the Chinese government's inability to provide them with the materials and the equipment that they need? <coughs> Not that I am aware of. Okay. Well, I just want to say that uh, the hospitals in my district, like Holy Cross Hospital in Silver Spring, which I spoke with, have been complaining precisely of all of the things that the hospitals you spoke with are complaining about, the severe shortages of testing supply, the uh, erratic and inadequate supply chain, the difficulty maintaining adequate staffing, and so on. Is there any reason to think that any of these hospitals were lying to you? No, I, I do not believe the hospitals were being misleading and providing us with this information. And has anybody questioned the, the veracity? of their statements to you? There have been uh, generally uh, uh, voiced concerns about the veracity of the findings, but we did not go independently go behind and verify, but those are that's the detail that was provided to us by hospitals. Well, thank, thank you for your hard work, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Raskin. As a reminder, and to ensure all members have a chance to ask their questions, members are asked to adhere to the five minute question limit, please. Next, we will have Mr. Keller. Mr. Keller, you are now unmuted. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm disappointed that we have not resumed normal committee activities in person and under proper protocols. Congress has proven it can do business in person with proper social distancing and hygienic measures. Several House committees have held in-person hearings during this pandemic, and COVID-19 should not be an excuse as the abdication of our responsibilities and removing minority party rights, but that is just what the majority has done. These briefings have become nothing more than a way to skip normal order, cut Republican members out of the process, and further politicize a pandemic that we should be all working together to stop. I would just say that while I appreciate Ms. Grimm being with us virtually, she has not been sworn in to give her testimony. I hope to have committee business done in person following committee rules with sworn in witnesses going forward. Uh, the one question I would ask is when I hear people talking about, uh, it was early, I think it was Chairman Connolly was saying about the percentage of the, the uh, amount of material that was asked for and then what the percentage of it they received, like they asked for so much and they only got 80% and some asked for so much and got 110%. What did they actually need? And I think that's what our, our, we should be focused on, not what somebody asks for, but did, do they actually get, like Governor Cuomo asked for a lot of things, but turned out he didn't need them. So are we planning on when we look at how things are allocated, looking, did everybody get what they needed to take care of the people they have? And, or, and did some people just request more than what was required? Is there any plans to actually look at the, the, how the needs were met without, uh, putting other areas in jeopardy by not having supplies available. Thank you for your question, uh, Representative Kaufman. It's a, it is a good question to think about uh, what uh, existed at the ground level and uh, what was needed and what was actually done with that supply. And we are, we are looking, um, it's not something that would be 
uh, able to be done uh, very quickly, but we are looking at something that could be a comprehensive view uh, later on down the road of tip to tail what happened uh, from the federal down to the local level, uh, which could include an examination of uh, supplies and uh, use of supplies. Yeah, because if you look at what happened, and, and we should, we did everything we should have, but things were requested, and I'll, I'll say in New York, and, and were deployed to New York, but they didn't need them all. And then the governor there said, well, they just sent them elsewhere. Uh, I don't think we need that middleman to send them elsewhere, deploy what needs to be deployed to the, to the areas they need to go, and manage that supply chain. That's supply chain management. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I think being what Representative Jordan said, did we meet the original goal of what we did with our shutdown, making sure that our healthcare system could provide what it needed to provide? We, we actually met that goal, didn't we? Being able to, the healthcare, the, healthcare, the healthcare system in America did not collapse under this because we met the goal, correct? Like it did in other nations. We do, I cannot comment on that. We do not have work on that. I will say, I will say on, between March 23rd and March 27th, we, in talking to hospitals, identified extreme shortages, which was reported in the report. Right. But every, everybody that needed a ventilator got a ventilator. Everybody that you know needed care got care at our, at our hospitals. On the topic of ventilators, we did not, uh, for that time period, identify any hospital who told us that they uh, were, were uh, experiencing shortages in rendering ventilator care but we're expecting to have uh, shortages down the road. Were any hospitals unable to provide care for people with COVID-19 that you, that, you, that you interviewed? We did not ask that question specifically, but they did report to us that they were treating patients, a lot of them, as presumptive positive, which had downstream effects on beds, on staff, on supplies, uh, because of uh, shortages related to testing. Did, did any hospitals run out of beds or places if they needed to hospitalize somebody for COVID-19? I don't, I, I don't have that uh, answer at the, tip of my, at the tip of my fingers. So we're not aware of anybody that needed care that didn't get it? I, I, we did not ask that question in that way. Well, if we're trying to find out how we did as an agency to provide care for American citizens, and people that might have COVID-19, wouldn't they be good questions to ask? So again, that report was meant to be a quick turnaround product. We asked three questions. Uh, what challenges are you experiencing? What are your mitigation strategies? And what do you need? Okay, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Keller. Next, we will go to Ms. Spear. Thank you. Uh, you can hear me? Yes. Can you, can yeah. you see me? No. You can't see me. Um, okay, let me see if I can get that. Is that working now? No, no okay. I still can't see you. Okay. Now, I can. now you can't? All right. Um, let me just start off by saying this. Madam Chair, um, I applaud you for holding this <clears throat> briefing hearing. Um, I think that it is as good as any briefing or hearing we would have in the Capitol itself. Um, you know, the 21st century has required Fortune 500 companies to look at whether or not they can work remotely, and they have been thrilled to find out that they can. So um, I would like to associate myself with all those who feel that by working remotely, we still are doing our jobs, in fact, maybe doing our jobs uh, even more directly with our communities. I know my staff and I have been working to get PPE, PPE for our hospitals, sourcing them from all over the place, and also uh, getting the PPP loans for our small businesses. So um, thank you for doing this. Uh, this is as good as it gets. Uh, let me uh, move on to ask Inspector General Grimm uh, a question. On March uh, 23rd to 27th, you did this uh, snapshot survey. Uh, you then reported it on April 3rd, and shortly thereafter, the President of the United States was asked about it, and he said it was phony, that it was fake, wasn't true. And then on May 1st, he decided to appoint 
a new inspector general. Um, I am concerned about the uh, independence moving forward of inspector generals if they feel they cannot uh, provide any bad news uh, without fearing that they're going to lose their jobs. Can you comment on that? A couple of points uh, that were raised there. Uh, we have been preparing for an inspector general since the last um, presidentially appointed Senate confirmed inspector general retired in June of 2019. Um, so putting that out there, um, I do think that independence is the cornerstone of what any office of inspector general does. And uh, that allows us to be impartial in the work that we do and to go right down the middle in providing uh, facts and letting those facts um, take that take us where they may. And uh, it is a critically important element of any Office of Inspector General. All right. So you don't think there's a chilling effect if uh, you say something or do something that is offensive to the president that you will be removed from office? You know, I, I, I personally and professionally cannot let the idea of uh, providing um, unpopular information uh, drive decision making in the work that we do. And I think today, I hope members are hearing that the 14 jobs that we have planned um, to protect people, to protect funds, to protect infrastructure and to ensure effectiveness, uh, we are operating uh, as we did uh, uh, on May 1st, okay. we are, All right. we are plowing you. ahead. Let me, um, let me move forward with uh, an issue area. Uh, we've had 118,000 residents and staff at nursing homes that have been infected and 19,600 who have died. That's almost 20% of those who have died from the coronavirus. Uh, I understand you have uh, new planned work items regarding nursing homes. I'm interested in knowing whether or not you are going to look at the difference between for-profit nursing homes uh, and nonprofit nursing homes, because it appears that the for-profit nursing homes were less prepared for the pandemic than the not-for-profit ones. Mm. It's a very interesting question. We do have uh, several jobs that are related to um, nursing homes and the idea of uh, ownership and whether it's for profit or not for profit is uh, frequently a consideration in our work as is rural and non rural. Uh, so I will take that. We will, I will take that question back and we will get back to you on whether or not it's already baked into our work. I wouldn't be surprised that it is because we do often consider that issue. I would also ask that you look at PPE. In my district, PPE for nursing homes was totally um, nil. And but for the county providing some, there would not have been any. Um, furthermore, board and care facilities and independent and assisted living facilities uh, come under no review or regulation whatsoever. And I hope that you will at least contemplate that in your work as well. Uh, finally, one last question. Uh, the issue of ventilators, we have about 160,000 ventilators, I'm told, uh, and I'm also told that we must maintain that number in order to be prepared for uh, waves of the pandemic occurring uh, later this summer into the fall. Uh, the president has just announced to the Congress that he is going to convey as a gift to the um, Russian people and to Vladimir Putin, $5 million worth of ventilators. Uh, have, are you able to make any kind of a, a snapshot uh, survey of the same hospitals that you surveyed back in March to find out whether or not um, the reduction of $5 million worth of ventilators will have an impact on them? Uh, thank you for that question. We do we do not have plans to repeat that same survey. Um, we're exploring that same methodology in talking uh, to laboratories uh, and uh, uh, for uh, ventilators. Again, I think the closest piece of work that we have is the audit 
uh, looking at the strategic national stockpile. Uh, but that's that's the work that we have ongoing. I would also point you to, you mentioned independent living facilities as part of our health and safety audits. We are considering uh, work, we're doing work that is looking at adult day centers and individual supported living facilities. We are looking at life and safety uh, issues and whether or not they're controlling for emerging infectious diseases. We recognize that that is an incredibly vulnerable population and it is that is a top priority for us. Great, thank you very much. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, next we will go to Ms. Plaskett. Ms. Plaskett, you are now unmuted. Thank you. Can you hear? Can you hear me at this time? Yes. Hi. Good morning. Thanks for uh, taking some. This has been a lot of questions, and a lot of information has been conveyed about um, how the country is responding to this virus and the support that's being given to hospitals and um, throughout the nation. I'm concerned about those hospitals that are very rural. And while we have seen an immediate um, request for PPEs and ventilators in those areas that are more metropolitan, are you all keeping aside those things that you believe will be necessary um, if there is an increase or um, if the numbers increase in areas that we have not seen already in the United States? Well, OHG does recognize that the pandemic poses challenges for all regions, um, but it does vary from state to state, county to county, and city to city, and issues um, related to urban and rural. We are looking at um, how some of the um, expanded capabilities that CMS is allowing, um, including telehealth, um, have uh, sort of impacted patient care. Um, in particular for rural areas, uh, looking at um, audio only tele telecare. Uh, and we're, as I said earlier, mindful of urban and rural issues in a lot of the work that we plan and that we do. Um, so I'm of course going to bring it home to the Virgin Islands where we're concerned of course, if we should have a surge in cases or there be a second wave. Um, our Department of Health and our governor have done a good job in making sure that there's been sufficient social distancing, um, taking care of our elders. So we've not seen a large number of cases. However, with the reopening and people traveling, potentially our, ho our hotels reopening, um, many of us have a concern that we might get another wave and much larger. And with a hospital that is enormously um, very small and has been compromised um, because of the 2017 storms, of course, uh, that, that concern becomes real. I mean, we don't have sufficient hospital beds uh, in normal circumstances right now. Are you all or have you seen accountability taken into that for areas like uh, the Virgin Islands? Um, to be able to receive, you know, their portions of um, the funding that's being provided to build out hospital beds um, to the Army Corps of Engineers and others. Um, the notion of us having to pay a cost share of that makes it much more um, untenable. You know, the, there's a concern that should we have to do that, we're not going to be able to make that cost. Um, have you all looked at that and have you done any studies to determine if cost share waivers should be given for those kinds of um, necessities? Uh, so we are doing an audit of CARES Act provider release relief funds, the distribution of the $50 billion to healthcare providers and whether or not um, those calculations were um, calculated correctly and funds um, distributed appropriately. So we are we are looking at that. I will tell you, um, as you may know uh, from the snapshot report, the 23rd through the 27th, we did hear from rural hospitals um, their concerns about not being able to meet uh, patient care needs. There was a quote in the report that there's no mothership there to come save them. 
Um, uh, so we are aware of those issues and um, we also have some work, uh, which I neglected to mention a minute ago, uh, conducting compliance related oversight. Um, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I just mentioned that, I apologize. The compliance related oversight in the payments, the provider relief fund, we are, we are looking at that, which is would touch on some rural issues. Great, so with that discussion and the cost share, can I ask, um, so certain hospitals, as you're aware, certain hospitals in the United States, including children hospitals, cancer hospitals, rural hospital, hospitals, and those located in the territories, continue to be paid by Medicare solely under a reasonable cost-based system that predates the Medicare hospital's inpatient prospective payment system, the IPPS, um, established in 1982, or what we know as TEFRA. So TEFRA hospitals like the Virgin Islands were uneligible for outlier payments under the CARES Act. Um, and this is an IPPS add-on payment for COVID-19 patients during an emergency period. Um, however, if a TEFRA hospital's inpatient operating costs exceed its ceiling, hospitals paid under TEFRA may request a payment adjustment for those costs. Both U.S. Virgin Islands hospitals reimbursements are based on years 1982 and 1996, where those rebasings were done respectively after um, major hurricanes. And we, both of our hospitals have requested a new base here because current costs of inpatient care at both hospitals are not comparable to the costs during those base years of 1982 and 1996. Do you know what that status for that request is? And will um, the cost, should there be an increase or a surge in COVID cases, um, make that more untenable for us? I, I do not have any information on the status of that. Um, our work generally as an oversight entity, because we don't administer the program, mm -hmm. um, would be to look at whether rules are being followed, whether there are inefficiencies potentially in the way um, reimbursement might be structured, but we would not, um, we do not uh, generate those policies. We audit or evaluate against um, existing rules. So would you then be able to do an audit to determine if those base years that we have are in keeping with the costs of what's happening um, of costs, inpatient costs in the Virgin Islands now? I think I, we can take that issue back, certainly, um, to our auditors to see if there's work that um, relates to that specific issue and uh, potentially sit down with you. Okay, we'll, we'll follow up. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you, Ms. Kleska. Next, we will go to Ms. Tlaib. Oh, thank you so much. I don't know if folks can hear me. I really appreciate this. Thank you to Chairwoman um, uh, Maloney for this as well. Uh, I want to, you know, center a lot of what we're doing. We, you know, we always talk about review and oversight, but I think it's really important to bring our districts in the room and the people that are outside uh, of the halls of Congress. I just want you all to know, um, as of two days ago, I know my city, city of Detroit, had over 10,000 cases and over 1,300 deaths. Wayne County alone, outside of uh, the city of Detroit, which is the largest county in the state of Michigan had over 9,000 cases and just over 1,000 deaths. Um, I say that because I remember being in committee and asking uh, Dr. Foshi uh, if there was gonna be 1.5 million people that are going to contract uh, COVID. He said, I don't know where you got that information from. That's not true. I think we've sur surpassed 1.3 million now. And again, I wanna center this and why oversight is so critically important. Um, and we can do this in a way that keeps us all safe, uh, because like me, like many of you are mothers, um, caretakers of your elderly parents and others. So we can we can be able to do the job uh, that our folks sent us to in this way and do it very effectively. Um, the question I have for you, um, Inspector General, is, you know, one of the things that's happened with HHS's distribution, uh, they call it, the, you know, the Provider Relief Fund is that HHS reported that it distributed $50 billion to facilities and providers across the country based on their prior Medicare reimbursements uh, and share of net patient revenue. Um, when we took a deeper dive in my district on this particular issue, 
HHS had distributed about $30 billion in the first batch of public health and social services emergency fund. However, my district, Michigan's 13th congressional district, which is the third poorest congressional district in the country, uh, received least amount of funds of any Michigan congressional district. My district received $27 million compared to up to $138 million in other Michigan districts, which are much more wealthier, uh, have some of the largest, uh, you know, hospital like headquartered and so forth. Uh, and again, you know, looking at my district and seeing again, having the, I think the youngest person to die from COVID is a five-year-old girl in my district. Uh, I just really would love for you to explain, Ms. Grimm, you know, to me, how is, does the hardest hit district in Michigan and one of the hardest hit in the country can receive the least amount of funds of any congressional district in the state? And I have a follow-up question, if I may. Um, thank you for your question, Representative Tlaib, and I, you know, I know your state has been particularly hard hit by the COVID epidemic, and we are very, very mindful of, uh, of, of locations and providers that have been hardest hit um, by the epidemic, and we have done our level best to make sure that we are um, meeting um, uh, providers and communities where they're at. For the audit that we are doing of the um, provider relief fund, um, we are looking at whether rules were followed in, uh, in, in the calculations um, and whether they were distributed according to those rules. You know, we are not second guessing how those formulas were arrived at as part of the work that we are doing. Um, shouldn't the HHS ID evaluate the substance of the method that was used that favored some of the larger, wealthier hospitals. My staff had sent me and showed me some of the most wealthiest for-profit corporate kind of really centered led hospitals got 50 billion compared to some of the smaller hospitals that I have in my district. Uh, again, that are uh, again, some of the hardest hits. Are we going to be looking at, at the method of which, you know, from wealthy hospitals while the smaller hospitals with, you know, less reserves to fall back on or continue to struggle? We don't have work on that right now. Um, I think that could be um, an issue that uh, would fall under um, potentially um, our effectiveness category. And uh, why don't I have our team come up and talk to you about um, some of the issues and and uh, just hear, hear what some of our authorities and jurisdictions that. are. No, I would really appreciate that. And I just want folks to know too, I hear people saying some of the hospitals are struggling now, the ranking member talked about that. But I, I want you all to know, this is a pandemic, a global pandemic. People are dying at a, such a huge rate, past even what the Vietnam War, our loss of loved ones then. And hospitals are closing, they're struggling. When we have some of the sickest people right now around the country, that tells you that something's wrong with our healthcare system not to blame whether or not we were doing the best job we could with uncertain times and the fact that we didn't know enough about, and we still don't know enough about COVID, but to say that it was because the economy shut down because we did it, no, it's because we were not prepared for this pandemic, nor did we even have a healthcare system that, um, and Inspector General, this is not towards you, this is just towards my colleagues with these theories that I just really wanna push back against. My God, the sickest people, the, we've had so many deaths and healthcare providers and, and, and hospitals are struggling. Uh, that tells you that we have a broken healthcare system. We should be looking at that specifically versus waiting and trying to point blame at folks where I don't think any of us wanted to see this many people die or to see any of our hospitals and anybody struggle right now. So thank you so much again uh, to the chairwoman for holding this hearing. Thank you, Ms. Tlaib. Next, we will go to Ms. Porter. Ms. Porter, you are now unmuted. Thank you so much, Ms. Grimm, for taking the time to be with the committee today. Um, on May 13th, I sent you a letter raising serious concerns about apparent instances of political leadership at BARDA, um, specifically about Dr. Cadillac allowing um, large pharmaceutical companies' lobbyists' opinions to carry more weight than those of our nation's leading scientists. I got your response back on Friday um, that you are not able to discuss any potential whistleblower complaints. And I understand that and I respect the HHS IG process. That being said, I don't believe that some of the questions can wait. 
or that they necessarily hinge on Dr. Bright's whistleblower complaint alone. So I wanna focus on just one of these questions today, which I think still gets at the heart of the concern that I raised. Dr. Kadlik, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, has started new programs to provide funding streams and opportunities for companies to fuel innovation. These initiatives, such as ASPR Next, um, the Division of Research, Innovation, and Ventures, DRIVE, um, were intended to lower the barriers for entry for companies and to increase access to funding. But there's evidence that they've become nothing more than a funding stream for companies that can't get funds under the previously long established process. This means that our taxpayer dollars may be wasted on projects with little scientific evidence, but that have great lobbyists. Has HHS OIG conducted a review of new projects such as Drive E and Asper Next for improper industry or political influence? And if not, would HHS OIG agree to do so? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman uh, Porter. I am familiar with your letter. I signed the response letter on Friday. Um, as, as I stated in that letter, we are unable to uh, confirm or deny the existence of, uh, of any investigation and that we um, do not uh, discuss um, whistleblower uh, retaliation matters. Um, in response to your larger uh, issue, we do have work that we are discussing internally now that has not been announced that we're still deliberating over. So sort of in the pipeline for deliberation, uh, looking at award procedures for research and development contracts from FY 2017 through May 2020 using the BARDA appropriations. And I think wonderful. That's so that's on the list of potential projects that you're Correct. taking to your team to discuss. And so how Correct. would the American public learn of when a decision and this committee, um, how would we best learn of what you've decided to proceed with for an investigation and the potential scope? Would that go on that list of the 14 projects that you described earlier in this hearing? So I want to be careful with the language. I we would not I would not um, characterize the 14 um, possible reports that we're doing the jobs that we're doing as investigations. Those would be audits or evaluations. Um, transparency and sunshine is core to what OIGs do. And here at HHS OIG, our work plan. Um, with the exception of certain cyber jobs, is public. So when we decide to go forward with a job, we update our uh, work plan, and it's a it's a living work plan, and we update it regularly. Uh, and we would be uh, we would reach out to you to let you know uh, because we know you're interested. Super. Thank you so much. I have a, a final question here about. Um, I've seen that you have been alerting the public about fraud schemes related to COVID-19 on your website. You mentioned that scammers are offering COVID-19 tests to Medicare beneficiaries, mostly seniors, in exchange for their personal details, including Medicare information. Um, and on your website, you go through a number of steps that seniors can take to protect themselves, but what proactive steps beyond having that information on your website. People are gonna find that I fear after they've been scammed um, and they're looking for what to do. What proactive steps is um, are you, um, the Office of Inspector General, taking to protect our seniors? We provide, uh, we are in constant contact with the CMS Center for Program Integrity. Um, we work closely. Great, could you tell me that. what they're doing? Cause that's actually, I'd like to hear what Administrator Verma and CMS are doing about this. Well, the, the first thing that uh, any campaign related to uh, protecting beneficiaries, uh, it's, a, it's a phrase that's been used for decades, it's guard your card, um, which is essentially um, never share your uh, beneficiary number. And now there are new numbers that are not linked to social security numbers. You know, do not share that with anyone that isn't your, you know, isn't your um, doctor or providing uh, care to you. So some of the phishing schemes where, you know, uh, folks are reaching out, um, you know, uh, uh, offering test kits, um, you know, sanitizing kits um, in return, just simply for your bene uh, beneficiary number. Don't do that. Never do that. Um, that is meant um, uh, to do sort of ill, <laughs> you know, to steal your um, medical identity. And um, in some instances, we've also sort of seen it associated with some kickback schemes, but guard your card, guard your number. 
Okay, thank you. I hope you'll consider doing an investigation or job, excuse me. Thank you for teaching me. I hope you'll consider doing a job about how COVID related um, Medicare uh, fraud has perhaps increased during this period and what additional steps we could ask CMS to be taking. Thank you so much. And I yield back. If I could say one thing just to that, um, whenever we become aware of a fraud scheme, whether it's a testing scheme, a purported cure scheme, a, um, an identity theft scheme, we are working very closely with um, the Department of Justice and our law enforcement partners. And uh, when we can, we, we put out fraud alerts and, uh, and we will continue to do that. Thank you so much. Next, I will turn, thank you. I will now turn it over to the chair for closing remarks. Chairwoman Maloney, you are now unmuted. Uh, well, first of all, I wanna thank uh, all of my colleagues and, and thank you again to Mrs. Grimm for being here today. As we close, I'd like to reflect on why this briefing is so important. The coronavirus pandemic is a generational crisis, and we are all in this together. If we face a second wave in the fall, as the director of the CDC and other public health experts have warned, we need to make sure that we are ready. And we need to replenish the national stockpile. We need to make sure hospitals are prepared for another surge if it happens. And as we find our way through this crisis, we will continue to depend on the HHS IG and all IGs to make sure our government's response is effective, efficient, and accountable. Thank you, everyone.